So I, I think it introduces uncertainty at a time where business has way too much uncertainty to deal with without the government deliberately introducing even more. Good morning. My name is Chris Hutton, and before we begin today's video, I wanted to take the opportunity to share the news that I have joined the Center for Risk Analysis as a senior policy analyst. I hope to bring a lot of added value to the already excellent body of work that the CRA puts out here on our YouTube channel, in our analysis for clients, and in our articles and press releases. And I hope to get the chance to engage with all of you who take the time to watch, comment on, and share our daily analysis here on our YouTube channel. But moving on to more important matters and today's analysis. Is the new draft agreement from the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition a form of protectionism or price controls? Joining me to unpack the document and its possible consequences is Donald Mackay, Director at XA International Trade Advisors. Donald, welcome to the CRA channel. Thank you, Chris. So Donald, can you give us an overview of what the agreement actually says, some of the details contained therein? So the agreement's called a reciprocal agreement. And it, it goes out to any company who is requesting uh, some kind of duty concession or duty protection um, from Minister Patel by way of the International Trade Administration Commission. So if you're asking for a duty increase, an anti-dumping duty, a removal of duty, before any of that happens, uh, you are presented with a, with a binding agreement. And the binding agreement really, outside of the fact that it, it is legally binding, um, has four components that you, you agree to. So over a three year period, you commit to creating a certain number of jobs, making a certain quantum of investment, investing a certain amount into, into training. Concern I have firstly is that this is no longer are you making a projection as you would have done in the past, kind of go, this is roughly what I think I will do. Uh, you're, you're tying yourself down to a legal commitment. And of course, imagine for a moment you had signed one of these agreements and Ukraine had happened or COVID had happened and you may not have been able to achieve your goals. It's not clear what position you would now find yourself in if these agreements had existed beforehand. Yeah, Donald, you mentioned there the sort of bind that this would, could put companies into in the future with unforeseen events. I mean, no one, some people would have foreseen a global pandemic coming, but no one would have specifically seen perhaps COVID-19 coming a few years ago, and that has radically changed a lot of business operations and their forecasts uh, for the future. What do you think of other possible effects that this will have on businesses' ability to conduct uh, their basic daily operations, especially in the context of very low growth prospects for South Africa in the short to medium term? The, the, the fourth component, which I apologize for missing, is, is a form of, of commitment to uh, limiting your price increases. So this is, if you get an anti-dumping duty, uh, you can't use this duty to push your prices up more than CPI over a three-year period. Now, you can, get a, you, you can get a waiver on this, but then you have to go and get permission. If you've got reasons why your, your costs are increasing even faster, as we would have right now with the high inflation rate, um, you, you would have to go and apply for a concession. You, you have to give feedback, by the way. Uh, it seems to be that you're going to be doing this every quarter. So the problem, the problem with doing all of this is we... we introduce a whole lot of factors which are external to the business into the business. We say um, your primary objective is no longer to give consideration to your shareholders, which is how businesses typically operate. But there are a whole different set of criteria you need to focus on. Uh, profit is no longer one of them. But of course, if you remove profit out of the equation, then you have no ability to fund all of the other things that government now wants you to do. Um, so it's not clear they intend dealing with that. And I would think this is going to have a couple of effects. The one is in a situation where you're, you are faced with dumping, you have a legitimate access to an instrument. And at nowhere in any of the legislation would you know that access to this instrument is conditional on something that was never there before. So you wouldn't know about this until the very end. And I, don't, I simply don't think that's fair. I think you should be aware up front before you put all the cost, time, and effort in, and then decide if you want to go ahead with it. So I, I think it introduces uncertainty at a time where business has way too much uncertainty to deal with 
without the government deliberately introducing even more. Donald, in terms of rule of law focused concerns, we often talk about the rule of law in South Africa, but I think it helps to always concretize it in terms of policy effects on the rule of law. So maybe focusing on the possible powers that this would grant the Minister of Trade, not just the current Minister, minister of Trade, but future administrations and ministers and bureaucrats. What do you think of, of that aspect of these agreements? Yeah, so we, we, we've been seen over the last few years as, as localization has kind of been reignited as this focal point, that we have a, we have a very strange space where, where policy is behaving like law, but it never actually becomes law. So for example, the law does allow the minister right now to request the reciprocal commitment if you ask for a duty increase, for example, but the law doesn't allow the minister to do such a thing if, if you have an anti-dumping action. However, your anti-dumping duty cannot be imposed until the minister, minister signs off on it. So all he has to do is just sit on it and, uh, and kind of wait for your, your, your business to dwindle away um, if that is what he chooses to do uh, or until you sign. So it's, it's starting, it isn't law, but, but it has all of the characteristics of it being law. And I do think that's a problem. You know, this migration away from the law, if we wanted to insert this into the law, the process should be, uh, they publish it, let's get, a, let's get a gazette out, get people to comment, take those comments into account, amend the legislation. But of course, that, that may not survive the process. And so we kind of, we, we've just inserted this weird kind of uh, proto-law, which I think is problematic. We're shifting focus a little bit to consumers. Now, consumers in South Africa are under immense pressure. Just this week, we had another increase in the fuel price. We have rising inflation. Moody's forecasts uh, inflation in South Africa for this year to be 8%, probably higher by some other accounts and analysis. What do you think that these agreements, what sort of impact could, could they have on already under pressure South African consumers? I, I think the agreements form part of a, of a bigger suite of, of products or views that government has, which is we have to, we have to grow the economy uh, by cutting out all competition. So any competition that isn't local, we should remove from the market. And that has the, the most obvious impact is that prices go up as markets concentrate. And I, I don't think we're going to be special in this case. So my, my prediction would be we're going to inflate costs. Ironically, though, in this whole process, the amount of time it takes investigations to complete is it's simply taking longer and longer. So ironically, if you kind of looked at the one side of it, you've got an extremely protectionist view right now, which is, is carried all the way through by, by the different government departments. But that doesn't apply to the implementation date. So we're, we're wanting to take more and more aggressive actions, but at the same time, they're taking longer and longer, which is very confusing to me. And I would, I think a part of that delay is an artifact of the fact that the minister is negotiating in person with every single company on a reciprocal agreement. And so th there's a weird new bottleneck that was never there before that's now been created. So you might say the view is to protect more, but ironically, it now takes a lot longer to get protection than it would have taken three years ago. And then just moving on to our final consideration, do you think that there could be possible alternative agreements or could these agreements take a different form which won't necessarily result in the possible negative consequences that you've touched on or do you think these sorts of agreements are always going to have these negative effects no matter what no matter how much maybe one tinkers with them i don't think you can you can fix an economic problem which is behavioral with an agreement so i i, I you know i think we have two problems with the agreements the one is then they're, they're not they're not a secret, but they're not open either in the public domain. So you can't, you can't simply go to the ITAC website or DTIC's website and have a look at this agreement. They're not contained in any of the regulations or laws that govern these processes. So I think the secrecy of this is problematic. And I, I always get nervous when, when business and government come to secret agreements, um, very often, and I'm not suggesting this is occurring here, but very often those agreements uh, end up poorly, as, as we've seen with the Zondo Commission. So I, I think the secrecy 
is almost a bigger problem than the fact of the agreement. Because not allowing people to contend with this up front, it's kind of a, it's a surprise happening right at the end of the process. And I, yeah, I don't think that's good. Thank you very much for your time and analysis with us today, Donald. To you, the viewer, thank you very much for watching. And before you leave, remember to leave a comment with your thoughts down below. Also remember to like, share and subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet done so. I'm Chris Hutton for the Center for Risk Analysis. Until next time, take care.